Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing okay. In this video, we'll be talking in detail about the anatomy of the cerebellum. Now, to contextualize the topic a little bit better, we'll talk about the location of the cerebellum and the overall bigger picture of the motor system organization. Next, we'll talk about the 3D cross anatomy of the cerebellum. Then, we'll try to visualize the horizontal and the sagittal sections of the cerebellum. Lastly, we'll talk about the neural circuitry of the cerebellum, both within the cerebellum in itself, and we'll talk about the different neural loops of the cerebellum, which the cerebellum makes with different external structures in its attempt to maintain the muscle tone, balance, and contribute to motor planning. Now, before we go on to describe the cerebellum, let's just do a quick recap of the motor system organization with the help of a schematic which we covered in one of our earlier videos. Now, you would have seen the schematic already if you had listened to my first video on the motor system. Here in the center, you can see the horizontal slices which have been taken at various levels of the central nervous system. For instance, here you can see the horizontal section which has been taken through the spinal cord. This is the section taken through the lower part of the medulla followed by the upper part of the medulla over here. Then you can see the horizontal section taken through the pons followed by the midbrain. This is the section taken through the central nervous system where the thalamus and the internal capsule are situated. Lastly, this is the coronal or the side-to-side -side slice which is taken through the cerebral cortex. In the original video, we discussed that the reflex arc was the basic foundation or the building stone of the motor system. And we explained in detail the five different components of the reflex arc, which included the receptor which brings in the sensory information through an afferent sensory neuron into the central integration center which could be the spinal cord or it could be uh, any part of the brain and then the central integration center then ejects out the motor command through an affected neuron to the effector which could be a muscle or it could be simply a gland then we said that the reflex arc was under the influence of the higher centers such as the cerebral cortex which was influencing the reflex arc via the descending neural pathways these descending neural pathways are in fact the upper motor neurons situated inside the central nervous system some of them are excitatory while some of them are inhibitory however the dominant effect is that of inhibition and that is why when somebody has an upper motor neuron lesion anywhere inside the central nervous system then that results in the loss of that inhibition resulting in hyper excitability of the reflex arc and that is the reason why an upper motor neuron lesion presents with a spastic paralysis meaning thereby that there would still be weakness of the body or specific part of the body however on clinical neurological motor examination you will see hyperreflexia and the tone would be increased as well so you'll see hyperreflexia and hypertonia Unlike the lower motor neuron lesion where the weakness would be associated with hypotonia and hyporeflexia. Then as part of the descending upper motor neuron pathways, we also studied in detail about the corticospinal tract extending all the way from the cerebral cortex going down to the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord shown by this red dotted line over here and in the subsequent lectures we'll also talk about uh, the upper motor neuron corticonuclear pathways shown by the pink dotted line over here starting from the cerebral cortex going to the cranial motor nerve nuclei the corticonuclear tracts will influence the reflex arc at some higher levels in the central nervous system such as inside the brain stem then we said that there were other components of the motor system as well which you can see in this schematic over here these included the cerebellum and the basal ganglia and we said that both the cerebellum and the basal ganglia were connected through different neuronal loops with the cerebral cortex but they did not have any direct access to the reflex arc down below over here therefore they modulated the reflex arc the function of the spinal reflex arc by indirectly modulating the activity of the cerebral cortex and that is the reason why with a lesion in the cerebellum or inside the basal ganglia the patient usually does not suffer with an outright paralysis rather different other kinds of impairments of the motor activity are elicited such as problems with the motor coordination and impairment volitional activity. So let's just talk about now the cerebellum in a little bit more detail as part of this lecture. So as a first step now let's try to find out where the cerebellum is situated. 
Now here you're basically looking at a mid-sagittal section, an anteroposterior mid-sagittal section, which has been taken through the head and neck region. You can see an illustration of the prosection over here, and you can see the same mid-sagittal section shown through an MRI over here. So let's just orientate this prosection a little bit. You can see the cranial cavity over here. This is the floor of the cranial cavity, and you can see the brain residing inside it. You can see the brain stem in the front over here with the cerebellum behind the brain stem over here. The brain stem then can be seen continuing down as the spinal cord, and this is the spinal cord running inside the vertebral canal over here. You can see the same features over here as well. You can see the brain inside the cranial cavity. Uh, this is the cerebral cortex characterized by its uh, gyri and its sulci. You can see the brain stem here. This is the midbrain followed by the bumpy pons and the medulla continuing down as the spinal cord and the cerebellum is situated right behind over here so let's just zoom into the cerebellum let's just highlight the location of the cerebellum you can see the cerebellum as the posterior relation of the brain stem and the cerebellum is situated inside the posterior cranial fossa it is covered over here by this partition of the dura matter which is known as the tentorium cerebellum which is going to form the roof of the cerebellum to turn Therefore, cerebellum is an infratentorial structure. You can see a little space over here, a diamond-shaped space over here, which is bounded by the cerebellum at the back and by the pons and the medulla oblongata in the front. This is the fourth ventricle. It is the part of the ventricular system, which is a sandwich between the cerebellum and the brainstem. The fourth ventricle is connected above over here with the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct, and it continues down into the spinal cord as the spinal canal. Now let's just talk about some of the gross morphological features and divisions of the cerebellum. Now you can consider the cerebellum as a large flat sheet of gray matter. If I curl this hand of mine over here, which is the cerebellum, this large flat sheet of gray matter, if I curl it like that, then you can see that the upper and the lower ends of this large flat sheet of gray matter, they kind of come in the front and they meet with each other. So in this case, if I put this cerebellum, this curved large flat sheet of gray matter into the posterior cranial fossa, then you can appreciate over here that the cerebellum would be having the brain stem as its anterior relation over here. Here. So this is our pons and the medulla and the midbrain over here forming the anterior relation of the cerebellum and this would be the posterior aspect of the cerebellum. Cerebellum would then be residing over here in the posterior cranial fossa underneath the occipital lobes of the cerebrum behind the brain stem. Now here you're looking at the cerebellum from its superior aspect. You can see that there is a central there is a central constricted part of the cerebellum in the in the middle over here this is known as the vermis whereas these two lateral extensions of the cerebellum one on either side these are the cerebellar hemispheres you can see the central constricted part of the cerebellum here as well this is once again the vermis uh, the left cerebellar hemisphere is kind of gone over here but you can still appreciate the right cerebellar hemispheres clearly now the cerebellum can be divided uh, sagittally into three zones. This part over here we discussed was the vermis. Then this part over here, which is the proximal part of the cerebellar hemisphere, which is in close proximity to the vermis. This is known as the paravermis. It is also known as the pars intermedius. The difference between the vermis and paravermis is that both parts are actually concerned with motor coordination. However, the vermis is uh, linked with controlling the axial body musculature, the proximal body musculature, which includes the muscles of the, of the trunk region and the shoulder and the pelvis with girdles, whereas the paravermis is actually linked with controlling the appendicular musculature or muscles of the upper limb, the muscles of the lower limb. The remaining major chunk of the cerebellar hemisphere, this is known as the cerebrocerebellum. We'll talk about that later as well. This is actually linked with the motor planning. Now here, once again, you're looking at the superior aspect of the cerebellum. And on this surface over here, you can actually see a fissure shown by these uh, red dotted lines over here. You can see there is a fissure here. This is known as the primary fissure and that actually separates the superior surface of the cerebellum into an anterior lobe in the front uh, and the middle lobe 
uh, at the back over here. The anterior lobe is color coded in red over here. The middle lobe has been color coded in green. The middle lobe is also sometimes known as the posterior lobe. So these two terminologies are used interchangeably, but the middle and the posterior lobe basically refer to the same part of the cerebellum. Uh, once again, you're looking at the prosection of the cerebellum down below here. You can see the primary fissure very clearly visible on the superior surface of the cerebellum, separating the anterior lobe in the front from the middle or the posterior lobe at the back. Now what I've done over here is that I've rotated the cerebellum a little bit so that you can see the posterior aspect of the cerebellum here. Uh, once again, the central constricted part in the center over here, this is known as the vermis, clearly visible here. And then you can see the right cerebellar hemisphere popping out over here. Now we're looking at the cerebellum from the back. So this could be basically the middle lobe or the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. Now within the cerebellum, within the middle lobe of the cerebellum, you can see a fissure over here. This is known as the horizontal fissure and that basically breaks up the middle or the posterior lobe into two halves so you can see the superior surface and the inferior surface of the cerebellum being separated from each other by the horizontal fissure the horizontal fissure does split up the middle lobe into its two halves uh, but it does not create any extra lobes in the cerebellum so the horizontal fissure basically is a part of the middle or the posterior lobe now here you're looking at the cerebellum from its inferior aspect and you can see the inferior surface of the cerebellum shown in this little uh, cartoonic illustration over here. This is the same inferior view of the section of the cerebellum you can see the central constricted part of the cerebellum here which is known as the vermis uh, the central constricted part is clearly visible over here as well these are the two cerebellar hemispheres popping out and what you can see over here is that the cerebellar cortex on its inferior aspect has this little projection which is known as the tonsil tonsil is part of the cerebellar hemisphere this is one of the gross morphological features which you can actually use to orientate the cerebellar process as well the tonsil is always going to be present on the inferior aspect it has a huge clinical significance to it as well whenever there is any space occupying lesion inside the cranial cavity which occupies a lot of space acutely for example a hemorrhage inside the cranial cavity that can actually cause pressure on the brain to pop out to eject from the areas of least resistance and the areas of least resistance are naturally going to be the foramina the biggest foramen inside the cranial cavity is the foramen magnum which is situated at the base of the cranial cavity and because of the rise in the intracranial pressure acutely the brain stem especially the medulla oblongata and the tonsillar part of the cerebellum which is the most inferior aspect of the cerebellum they get ejected out through the foramen magnum and they kind of get stuck over here and there the tonsils can actually compress upon the medulla which contains the cardiorespiratory centers and therefore that could lead to cardiorespiratory arrest now here you're looking at the ventral or the anterior surface of the cerebellum. Uh, you can see the central constricted part of the cerebellum here clearly, which is known as the vermis. And then we already said the bilateral extension of, from the vermis. This is known as the cerebellar hemisphere. And you can see the right cerebellar hemisphere clearly visible over here. Now this cigar shaped structure, which you can see over here, kind of off white in its appearance. These are the peduncles of the cerebellum. What are peduncles? Peduncles are basically the white matter tracts or bundles of white matter fibers, which connect the cerebellum with the brainstem. So if you look over here, uh, this is the brainstem intact present right in front of the cerebellum. So you can't really see the ventral aspect of the cerebellum if the brainstem is intact. Brainstem has three different subparts to it. This is the pons, which can be clearly seen over here in front of the cerebellum. Down below, we can see the medulla oblongata. The midbrain is kind of absent over here. You can see uh, the pons is characterized by these transversely running fibers. These are the pontocerebellar fibers. And all these pontocerebellar fibers are actually going into the cerebellum through the middle cerebellar peduncle. So the cerebellum is connected with the pons through the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now, uh, if you if we take a section through the middle cerebellar peduncle over here and remove the brain stem, then we can see the section of the middle peduncle over here. Behind the middle cerebellar peduncle, you can see the superior and the inferior cerebellar peduncles kind of combined over here. The superior cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum with the upper part of the brainstem, 
which is the midbrain, and the inferior cerebellar pinnacle connects the cerebellum with the lower part of the brainstem, which is the medulla oblongata over here. And you can see since both the superior and the inferior cerebellar pinnacles are hiding behind the middle pinnacle, therefore in case of an intact brainstem, we can only see the middle cerebellar pinnacle. We need to cut through it to be able to uncover the superior inferior pinnacles which are hiding behind it. Then on the ventral aspect of the cerebellum, you can actually see this little uh, projection over here. This is actually part of the cerebellar hemisphere, which is called as the flocculus. Uh, there's a flocculus on the other side as well, obviously, which is missing here because obviously we can't really see the left cerebellar hemisphere in between the two flocculi, which means the flocculus on the right and the flocculus on the left. In between them, this part of the vermis, this is known as the nodule. And together, to the two, the two flocculi, and the nodule in the center, they form another lobe of the cerebellum, which is known as the floccular nodular lobe. This is also referred to as the vestibular cerebellum, and the function of this vestibular cerebellum or the floccular nodular lobe is to contribute to the balance regulation. Uh, you can see there's a, a sulcus over here, which is known as the posterolateral sulcus, or also known as the floccular nodular fissure, which separates the middle lobe or the posterior lobe at the back from the flocular nodular lobe in the front over here. So just to do a bit of a recap, the cerebellum has three different lobes to it, an anterior lobe, a middle or a posterior lobe, and a flocular nodular lobe. The anterior uh, lobe can be seen over here, uh, color coded in red. You can see the primary fissure over here. The primary fissure separates the anterior lobe in the front from the middle or the posterior lobe at the back. The anterior lobe is also known as the spinocerebellum and it helps regulate the muscle tone. It receives uh, the input from the stretch receptors such as the neuromuscular spindles and from the Golgi tendon organs via the spinocerebellar tract. Then we've got the middle or the posterior lobe shown in green over here, partly visible on the superior surface and partly visible on the inferior surface of the cerebellum. This is embryologically the most recent part of the cerebellum and it is sandwiched between the primary fissure in the front at the top and the flocular nodular fissure uh, in the front down below over here. It plays an important role in coordination and motor planning of the voluntary activity. Then lastly, we've got the floccular nodular lobe, which is also known as the vestibular cerebellum, color coded in blue over here. This is embryologically the most primitive part of the cerebellum, and it comprises of the flocculi, one on either side, the flocculus here, the flocculus here, which is part, which are part of the cerebellar hemispheres, sandwiching the part of the vermis in the middle, which is known as the nodule, together forming the floccular nodular lobe. This helps in maintenance of the balance and the posture, and it receives input from the vestibular system directly or indirectly through the vestibular nuclei. And once again, we'll talk about the vestibular cerebellar loops much in much more detail later as part of this video. Now let's talk a little bit about the cellular organization of the cerebellum. Now here you're looking at a horizontal slice of the cerebellum uh, with the brain stem in the front over here. You can see uh, the transversely running fibers uh, passing through this part of the brain stem over here. These are the pontocerebellar fibers, so this would be the section of the pons. And you can see in this horizontal slice of the cerebellum, you can see that the outermost region over here, that is the gray matter, which is basically the cerebellar cortex. And then we've got the white matter over here, this branching pattern of the white matter tract fibers. This is known as the arbor vitae. And then there's gray matter once again on the inside, which represents the deep cerebellar nuclei. The outer layer, which is the cerebellar cortex, is actually characterized by three sublayers. These include the molecular layer, the Purkinje cell layer, and then the granule cell layer. And we'll talk about these later when we talk about the histological architecture of the cerebellum in a little bit more detail subsequently in this video. Just like the cerebral cortex that has got some elevations which are known as the gyri, and the depressions are known as the sulci. Similarly, inside the cerebellar cortex as well, we've got the elevations which are known as the folia and the depressions in between the two successive folia. These are known as the fissures. Then we've got the white matter here as we discussed already. These are the branching white matter tract fibers which are known as the arbor vitae. Arbor vitae is a Latin word which basically means the tree of life. 
this branching pattern of the white matter tract fibers kind of represents the branches of a tree and that's why it is known as the arbor vitae. It comprises mainly of the afferent and the efferent neurons which are entering into the cerebellum or exiting from the cerebellum. Then the gray matter on the inside of it here, this is the, these, these are the deep cerebellar nuclei. There are four deep cerebellar nuclei. If we start from the lateral or the outer side and make our way inwards, then the outermost nucleus over here, this could be the dentate nucleus, which has a kind of a bag-like, teeth-like appearance to it. This is the dentate nucleus inner to it we've got the emboliform nucleus and then we've got the globose nucleus the emboliform and the globose nuclei they are collectively sometimes referred to as the nucleus interpositus or the interposed nucleus and then the innermost nucleus over here this is the vestigial nucleus you can simply you can simply remember the names of these nuclei with the help of a mnemonic and the mnemonic goes somewhat as follows don't eat greasy food. Don't stands for dentate nucleus. Eat stands for emboliform nucleus. Greasy stands for the globose nucleus and food stands for vestigial nucleus. Now here you can see a sagittal section taken through the cerebellum uh, and you can see the deep cerebellar nuclei right in the middle over here. Then you can see the white matter tract fibers over here. This is arbor vitae and you can see the branching pattern of these arbor vitae over here. Then the outer more layer out then the outermost layer over here, this is the cerebellar cortex, and you can see uh, the elevations of the cerebellar cortex, which are known as the folia, very clearly visible over here. The depressions in between the two successive folia over here, these are known as the fissures. So you can appreciate the cerebellar cortex very nicely over here. Now here you can see a horizontal slice which has been taken through the cerebellum. You can see the brainstem in the front. Uh, this is the inferior view of the same horizontal slice, whereas this is the superior view of the same horizontal section. Now the way we actually figure out the superior and the inferior aspects of these horizontal slices is that we can actually look at the section of the brainstem in the front over here. See the section of the this appearance of the section of the brainstem here is different from the section. From, from its appearance over here. These are the transversely running fibers in the ventral aspect of the pons. So this area would represent the pons over here. These are the pontocerebellar fibers. In fact, these fibers are the biggest clue with the help of which you can actually identify the prosections of the pons. Uh, if you look at any of the sections of the pons, this region over here, this represents the midbrain. So the midbrain is gonna be at the top uh, compared to the pons. So, so therefore, this would be the superior view of the section. The reason why I'm saying this is a section of the midbrain is because here you can see the two peduncles of the midbrain. These are the cerebral peduncles. These are different from the cerebellar peduncles. The cerebellar peduncles were the connections between the cerebellum and the different parts of the brainstem. The uh, cerebral peduncles are part of the midbrain, basically meant for the passage of the corticospinal and the corticobulbar tract fibers. Here you can see the substantia nigra as well. You can see the cerebral aqueduct over here as well. So this is the section of the midbrain and hence this would be the superior view of the horizontal slice. Uh, behind the brainstem here you can see the cerebellum in both of these slices over here in both of these uh, superior inferior aspects of the same slice. You can see the folia or the elevations of the cerebellum over here and you can see the fissures in between the two successive folia. Remember this is a mulligan stain section which you're looking at over here so anything which is gray matter is going to appear blue in color and that is the reason why we've got this Blue color, we've got this bluish coloration in the cerebellar cortex because that is all gray matter and we've got some blue discoloration over here as well because of the deep cerebellar nuclei in the center however since you're looking at a very old stain over here so much of the stain is gone and that is why uh, much of the bluish discoloration here and in the center is gone as well Right, so as discussed uh, before as well, there are three peduncles in the cerebellum. What are peduncles? Peduncles were the white matter tract fibers containing the afferents and the efferents of the cerebellum, the neurons coming into the cerebellum and the neurons going out of the cerebellum. And these were the connections of the cerebellum with the three different parts of the brain stem, namely the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata.
Here, once again, you're looking at the ventral aspect of the cerebellum. The constricted part in the center is the vermis, and you can see the right cerebellar hemisphere over here. You can see the brainstem intact over here, comprising of the pons with the midbrain at the top, not clearly shown over here, and the medulla down below here. Now, if the brainstem is intact, so we can't really see the ventral aspect of the cerebellum clearly, what we can see are the pontocerebellar fibers of the pons going into the cerebellum through this middle cerebellar pedal. Now, if I take a section through the middle cerebellar peduncle, then we can see the section of the peduncle over here. And right behind the middle cerebellar peduncle, I can see the superior and the inferior peduncles. The superior cerebellar peduncle is a major outflow channel of the cerebellum, and it connects the cerebellum with the topmost part of the brain, so which is the midbrain. The middle cerebellar peduncle is a major inflow channel of the cerebellum, connecting the cerebellum with the pons, whereas the inferior cerebellar peduncle, that connects the cerebellum with the lower part of the with the lowest part of the brainstem which is the medulla oblongata now let's talk a little bit in detail about the intracerebellar neuronal circuits here you're looking at a vertical section or a sagittal section taken through the cerebellar hemisphere and you can see the outer more and you can see the outermost layer of the cerebellar hemisphere over here which is known as the cerebellar cortex the cerebellar cortex is characterized by these elevations which are the folia and then in between the successive folia we can see these depressions over here these are the fissures inner to the cerebral cortex we can see this branching pattern of the white matter tract fibers these are the axons of the afferents and the efferents of the cerebellum and they have a branching tree-like pattern to it that's why we call it as the arbor vitae inner to the arbor vitae once again we've got the deep cerebellar nuclei which are the dentate and polyform globos and the festigial nuclei the major efferents or the output fibers from the cerebellum are going to be ejected out from the deep cerebellar nuclei whereas the major afferents or the input fibers to the cerebellum can be divided into two groups these include the climbing fibers and the mossy fibers the climbing fibers include all the afferents which are coming from the inferior olivary nucleus whereas all the rest of the afferent fibers coming into the cerebellum they are grouped together under the category of the mossy fibers. Now let's have a look at the magnified view of the cerebellum over here to find out what happens to the afferents and the efferent neuron once they enter inside the cerebellum. On the right over here, you can actually see a schematic of the neural circuits inside the cerebellum. You can see the cellular organization of the cerebellum over here. The outermost layer of the cerebellum is the cerebellar cortex, which is comprising of three sublayers: the, the molecular layer, the Purkinje cell layer, and the granule cell layer. The, the Purkinje cell layer is characterized by the presence of these Purkinje cell neuronal cell bodies. Their dendrites are actually extending up into the molecular layer, whereas their axons are extending down through the arbor vitae to affect the deep cerebellar nuclei down below over here. Uh, the granule cell layer is corrected by these granule cells, which are part of the cerebellar cortex. Then we've got the afferents and the efferent neurons running over here. This is the region which is called as the arbor vitae. And then we've got the deep cerebellar nuclei down below over here. You can see that all the efferents are actually coming out from the cerebellum through the deep cerebellar nuclei. These are excitatory and hence are prokinetic. The deep cerebellar nuclei which are excitatory, these are under the influence of the Purkinje cell neurons which are inhibitory and they are inhibiting the prokinetic effect of the deep cerebellar nuclei. The two afferents which are entering into the cerebellum, these are the climbing fibers color-coded in green over here and the mossy fibers color-coded in yellow over here. The climbing fibers upon entering into the cerebellum, they basically give a direct connection to the deep cerebellar nuclei causing its excitation and hence producing a prokinetic effect. These climbing fibers, however, then ascend up through the arbor vitae and they synapse with the dendrites of the Purkinje cell over here inside the molecular layer and as a result cause excitation of the Purkinje cells. Through the Purkinje cells, these then eventually cause inhibition of the deep cerebellar nuclei and hence kind of bringing an end to the motor activity through a longer neuronal route over here.
the mossy fibers upon entering into the cerebellum over here they also cause direct excitation of the deep cerebellar nuclei but then ascend up through the arbor vitae to synapse with the granule cells inside the granule cell layer of the cerebellar cortex the difference between the climbing and the mossy fiber is that the climbing fiber is that the climbing fibers are going to synapse with the purkinje cell in a one-on-one fashion which means one climbing fiber is going to synapse with one Purkinje cell over here, whereas the mossy fibers have kind of a diffuse pattern to them. So one mossy fiber is going to synapse with several granule cells, which in turn would synapse through the parallel fibers with several several other dendrites of the Purkinje cells, and thus causing a diffuse spread of information. However, the main concept is still the same. The mossy fibers after the direct excitation of the deep cerebellar nuclei through a longer neuronal route they will cause inhibition of the deep cerebellar nuclei through the purkinje cell axons and thus bringing an end to the motor activity and this is important to know in terms of understanding the clinical manifestations of the cerebellar lesions because we commonly see clinical abnormalities such as past pointing and pendular knee jerk and the main uh, reason behind that is that because of the lack of inhibition of the Purkinje cell on the deep cerebellar nuclei the motor activity kind of overshoots its intended target and by the time the cerebral cortex which is the higher cognitive center that realizes that the motor activity has gone beyond the intended target it tries to correct that movement however the past pointing at that point has already happened so as a result of that correction the body tries to compensate for that mistake and so that is the reason why we actually see a pendular knee jerk as well now let's try to understand the modulatory role of the cerebellum in the motor control by learning about the neuronal circuits through which the cerebellum is connected with the rest of the body now let's take up the vestibular cerebellar connections by which the cerebellum helps in the balance regulation so here you can actually see a midline sagittal section taken through the brain. You can see the cerebellum at the back over here. You can see the fourth ventricle here, which is sandwiched between the brain stem in the front and the cerebellum at the back. The midbrain can be seen at the top over here, followed by this bumpy pons over here, and then the medulla oblongata down below. This is the area where the spinal cord is going to be present. So I've actually shown a horizontal slice taken through the spinal cord right over here. Now this color-coded region over here, this basically represents the vestibular nuclei and we can see some extraocular nuclei shown by these red circular uh, dots over here. These are the extraocular motor nerve nuclei, including the oculomotor, the trochlear and the abducent nerve nuclei. Now, the floccular nodular lobe or the vestibular cerebellar part of the cerebellum that receives the vestibular or the balance related information from the semicircular canals of the inner ear and from the otolith organs inside the inner ear. This information is going to enter into the floccular nodular lobe from the inner ear either directly or indirectly through the vestibular nuclei. So these are the vestibular nuclei shown in the brainstem over here. Now the vestigial nucleus is that deep cerebellar nucleus which is going to receive the vestibular information either directly from the inner ear or indirectly through the vestibular nucleus. So the vestigial nucleus is that part of the deep nuclei which is part of the vestibular cerebellar neural circuitry. The vestigial nucleus then projects back to the vestibular nuclei forming what is known as the vestibular cerebellar loop. The vestigial nucleus is also going to project to some other parts of the brainstem such as the reticular formation. The vestibular nuclei then project via the medial longitudinal fasciculus or the MLF to the cranial nerve nuclei here, which are the extraocular nuclei, uh, the third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve, and the sixth cranial nerve nuclei. These nuclei are then going to contribute to coordinate the eye movements, whereas the vestibular nuclei and the reticular formation, which were receiving the efferents from the vestigial nucleus, they are going to extend down over here as the vestibulospinal pathways and the reticulospinal pathways to control and to regulate the tone of the anti-gravity muscles. Hence, via these connections, the cerebellum plays an important role in maintaining the posture and the balance of the body while coordinating and adjusting the eye movements accordingly.
Now let's take up the spinocerebellar connections by which the cerebellum basically helps maintain the muscle tone and posture of the body. Vermis is that part of the cerebellum which is concerned with controlling the truncal or the axial musculature of the body, whereas the paravermis is that part of the cerebellum which is controlling the appendicular musculature of the body. Now once again over here we're looking at a midline sagittal section taken through the brain. We can see once again the cerebellum at the back over here, the brainstem in the front with the three different parts of the brainstem, in, namely the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And then you can see the cerebral cortex at the top over here. The spinocerebellar connections consist of the spinocerebellar pathways, which could be the anterior and the posterior spinocerebellar pathways, or the cuneocerebellar pathways. The anterior and the posterior spinocerebellar pathways are going to be coming uh, from the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, and they bring in the sensory information of proprioception or the position of the locomotory organs of the body, such as the muscles and tendons and the nerves and the ligaments, and they bring in this information about the about the location of the different uh, body parts into the vermis or the paravermis part of the cerebellar hemisphere. If the proprioceptive information is coming from the axial musculature, that information is going to be entering through the spinocerebellar pathways into the vermis region of the cerebellum. And if the proprioceptive information is coming from the appendicular muscles, then that information is going to enter into the paravermis part of the cerebellum. The cuneocerebellar pathway brings the same proprioceptive information into the cerebellum from the upper limbs. Now these spinocerebellar pathways, they are projected onto the deep cerebellar nuclei inside the cerebellum. And the deep cerebellar nuclei, which are part of the spinocerebellar pathways, are the interposed nuclei, which are the emboliform and the globose nuclei. The excitatory efferents, which are popping out from the emboliform and the globose nuclei, are then going to project to the thalamus, to the VA and the VL nuclei of the thalamus, either directly or indirectly through the red nucleus. The VL nucleus of the thalamus then projects to the precentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus then modulates the lateral corticospinal tract to regulate the distal limb muscle tone as part of the paravermal connections, and it modulates the anterior corticospinal tract to regulate the truncal and the proximal limb tone as part of the vermal connections. The red nucleus also gives rise to the rubrospinal tracts, which mediates control over the distal limb muscles. Now let's take up the cerebro-cerebellar connections through which the cerebellum helps regulate the initiation, planning, and timing of the voluntary motor activities. Once again, you're looking at a mid sagittal section of the brain. Uh, you can see the cerebellum at the back over here. You can three, see the three different parts of the brain stem over here, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. The brain stem uh, and the cerebellum are sandwiching the fourth ventricle in the middle over here. The cerebellar hemispheres receive input from the contralateral cerebral cortex about the intended motor activity or the motor plan via the corticopontocerebellar tract, which then projects to the dentate nucleus inside the cerebellum. The excitatory efferent output from the dentate nucleus then projects via the superior cerebellar peduncle to the contralateral VA or the VL nucleus of the thalamus, either directly or indirectly via the red nucleus. The VA and the VL nuclei of the thalamus then project to the motor and the premotor cortical areas over here. The motor and the premotor cortices then give rise to various tracts such as the cortical bulbar tracts, which influence the cranial nerve nuclei and the lateral corticospinal tract, which regulate the volitional synergistic motor activity of the appendicular region. The corticopontocerebellar fibers, which exit from the cerebral cortex, they regulate the output of the neocerebellum, of the cerebellar cortex. So what happens in the cerebro-cerebellar connections is that whenever the cerebral cortex makes a motor plan for bringing about a voluntary activity, a copy of that motor plan, which is known as the efference copy, that is actually sent down to the cerebellar cortex through the corticopontocerebellar fiber. So the cerebellum is basically made aware of the intended motor plan before the motor plan is actually executed. And now the cerebellum is in an ideal position to receive information 
information about the intended motor plan coming from the cerebral cortex and it also is in an ideal situation to receive the information about the actual motor activity through the spinocerebellar pathway so it is in a very good location to compare the actual motor activity with the intended motor activity and consequently bring about a motor correction if required so just to do a quick recap in this video on the cerebellar anatomy we talked a little bit about the gross anatomy of the cerebellum then we talked about the different slices taken through the cerebellum and we talked about the circuits of the cerebellum, the neuronal circuits situated within the cerebellum, as well as the different external neuronal loops through which the cerebellum is actually connected to different parts of the brain, such as the vestibular cerebellar loops, the spinal cerebellar loops, and the cerebral cerebellar loops. I hope you benefited from this video. If yes, then please do like the video and don't forget to subscribe the channel. Thank you very much. Bye for now.